in the past funding from the DON process through DPH, which unfortunately we no longer do. But um, our mission as a Chana has been to get the, those resources out into the community to have an impact on improving health outcomes for people in our region. So uh, we had done, have done that and continue to do it through the mini grant process. Mm -hmm. And we're excited to hear back from South Shore Resource and Advocacy Center, Sandra Blatchford. They're gonna talk about their mini grant on a housing initiative. So Sandra, I'll turn it over to you. And thank you for having me. And also we thank you for the funds that we received for the mini grant. The so Social Resource and Advocacy Center is a domestic violence resource agency, as well as we do have a homicide bereavement program and a program called Road to Healing, which provides services for victims and survivors and family members who have been impacted by impaired driving. Mm -hmm. The mini grant was specifically for our domestic violence services. And we, Social Resource and Advocacy Center, we've been providing domestic violence services for 18 towns in Plymouth County for over 40 years. And included in that, we have court-based advocacy, center and community-based advocacy, uh, hospital-based advocacy, uh, elder woman's program, grandparents raising grandchildren, teen dating violence, child witness to violence, mm -hmm. and a food pantry as well as a clothing closet and an emergency 24 hour hotline, as well as emergency backup services, a transitional housing program and housing stabilization, as well as emergency safe homing. We only have 15 staff, but over 27 volunteers who really make the agency work. Uh, our housing initiative, housing, our the initiative that we received funding for $3,500 for was called our safe housing initiative. And what that is, is it was for our safe homing. And what emergency safe homing is, is that oftentimes a survivor of domestic violence is fleeing from a very violent partner and they don't have a place to go. That it may not be safe with family or friends. They may not have strong connections to their family members because of the abuse. Oftentimes, in an abusive relationship, the individual is very okay. isolated and has. I'm lost, listening to a call, yeah. And has lost connection with strong support systems. There's also very often economic abuse, and somebody fleeing may not have access to housing may not be able to afford housing and is really searching for shelter. Sandra, so, can I interrupt you? I, I apologize. Sure. Um, I know someone had requested captions this morning. And uh, if anyone knows how to turn on captions, I don't see it as an option for me. So if anyone has that wisdom and they can put it in the chat, that would be really helpful. But Sandra, why don't you go ahead and we'll, we'll work with that on our end. Okay. Go ahead. Sorry about that. Oh, that's okay. So with the Safe Housing Initiative, what we, in 2021, we received the funding, and that was to provide emergency safe homing. What we experienced is when we applied for the funding is that in 2020, as we all know, when COVID hit, everything changed. And it really changed for survivors of domestic violence. They were living with their abusive partner. Uh, and years past, prior to COVID, we already were in a shelter crisis in the state of Massachusetts. We were already experiencing a housing crisis in the state of Massachusetts, but it was nothing to what we are experiencing now. And what we typically, prior to COVID, we would provide emergency safe homing. And what that is, is it's either in a private home or we utilize a hotel in our area that provides emergency safe homing. And they have been probably one of our strongest community partners. They have been amazing. And we would house someone for three to five days. When COVID hit, what we used to do in those three to five days is that we were able to get someone into shelter with their children, or we were able to get them out of state. We were also sometimes able to find intermediate housing and with housing stabilization funds, oftentimes we could work with a landlord to come up with first and last 
and for rental and the housing market completely changed finding rent finding apartments or housing that is affordable is extremely difficult and with covid we were no longer able to send people out of state that those options were gone and the shelter system couldn't take any more people so what started to happen is our 3 to 5 days turned into 2 to 4 weeks and and currently we've had our safe home and so going on two months, um, and what and we do have to pay for that. And what payment is is we do get a discounted rate for lodging, but we do have to also supply food and other resources for the individual that we are safe homing. So with the funding, what we did was we were able to provide emergency safe homing for four individuals and their children. And each individual was safe homed between two to three weeks each. They, we had a total of 12 children and four survivors. And while that doesn't maybe seem, we provided emergency safe homing for 30 families in 2021. Those four families were able, we were able to utilize the funding we received to provide a very safe environment for a survivor and her children. We were able to provide diapers, food, transportation, and assistance in locating long-term shelter. The outcomes for those four individuals is actually wonderful. One was able to move further, <laughs> further away in the state and was relocated for her and her children into housing. And the three others were able to find rental units that we were also able to provide rental assistance and housing stabilization funds, actually with funding that we received from the United Way, as well as from the Department of Public Health. So the outcomes for those families were positive and Emergency safe homing is one of our services that a lot of people don't always know about, that it's in the middle of the night someone might seek safe homing. It might be in the middle of the day. We receive calls from the police departments, from the hospital, and from other agencies or from the individuals themselves who are saying, I am, I am facing homelessness. I am, I am fleeing. I am not safe and I have nowhere to go. Um, two of the women that we provided safe homing to were about to be living out of their car with their children, and we were able to get them into a safe place and keep them there for three weeks. And that makes a very big difference in a children's life as well as a survivor's life, that outcomes improve when we are able to wrap, provide wraparound services and tell someone, yeah, we have the opportunity to keep you safe. We have the opportunity to make sure that tonight you are not sleeping out of your car with your children. And what we do is we also work with other providers during that time so that we provide that wraparound service so that people receive the assistance that they need to receive to move forward and to live their life freely without violence. And one of my favorite stories about safe homing is that we were providing safe homing over uh, Thanksgiving, one Thanksgiving, and we were able, the where they were staying, the hotel they were staying at, provided them with, and their children, with a Thanksgiving meal, a really nice Thanksgiving meal. And then for Christmas, they were still there, and Santa came for those kids that that year. And that individual was living out of her car until she was able to access emergency safe homing. So the safe, so the safe housing initiative, those funds, I truly believe made a great impact on four lot, four survivors and 12 of their children. And without the funding we received, those are four survivors that we may not have been able to help with their children. So thank you. That's great. Sandra, thank you so much.
And it's amazing that you were able to use a, a small amount of money to, you know, supplement what you were working on and, and make such an impact on, on, on those, on that, the people you were able to serve. Does anyone have any questions for Sandra or comments? This is certainly an important topic. We really appreciate uh, all the work that you do and sharing with us today. I thank you. All right. Well, thank you, Sandra. We're going to move on now. And I apologize. I, I don't think I have the correct settings or the correct version of Zoom to do the captions. So um, I think the captions will be available on the replay when we post the meeting. So we're hopeful that um, that, that'll be accessible to folks. Uh, so I'm happy to introduce our major topic today from the Harbor Health PACE program. We have Norma Murata, who is a Senior Community Relations Marketing Specialist, and Julie Richer, the Director of Marketing Communications and, Enro and Enrollment for Harbor Health's Elder Service Plan. And Julie, you uh, actually took me on a tour of the PACE uh, facility in um, Brockton a couple of years ago. So I'm excited for folks to hear about it. So Norma, I'll turn it over to you. Hi, thank you so much. Uh, are you able to let me share my screen? We do have a couple of PowerPoint slides that I just want to. That I can do. I'm pretty sure we have that ability. So if you want to try that now. Okay. Did it work? Yep, we can see that. Okay, great. Hi, everybody. Good morning. I see a lot of people who I know here and some who I don't. So very happy to be able to um, share this information with you. And thanks to Karen and Kim for inviting us to present today. Um, as Michael mentioned, we do have our center over in Brockton, which is where I mainly work out of, but Harbor Health Pace covers a very large area in greater Boston and going south down Route 24, Route 3, and pretty much everything in between those. Um, Harbor Health is a nonprofit healthcare organization. I see that we have Amy Bowen and Megan Graves from our Community Health Center side also on the call. So you may know us from our Community Health Center uh, in Plymouth at Cordage Park. We also have our center up in Boston and one down in Hyannis. So people of all ages use those. Um, and about 30 years ago, Harbor Health became a provider of PACE, which is a model of care. And it stands for Program of All-Inclusive Care for the Elderly. And it's also called Elder Service Plan. Um, this is a plan that was designed uh, back in the early 70s and grew to what we see it as now, uh, which is designed to help lower income, uh, older and disabled adults who have complex medical needs get health and social support at home and avoid transitioning to a nursing home. And how do we do that? Did it work? Next slide. Yes. Um, the model of PACE is based on the interdisciplinary team, or IDT, as we call it. Um, in healthcare and social services, we kind of live in an alphabet soup. So IDT is one of the newer terms that uh, I've learned since uh, being involved with PACE for the last year. A PACE interdisciplinary team is led by a geriatrician. In our case at Harbor Health, we have four they are full-time with us. They specialize in the care of older adults and they don't have any outside practices. So they're able to concentrate and develop close relationships with their patients who come from our participant base. Currently, Harbor Health has about 600 participants enrolled throughout the area that I described. And so each of these teams has about 150 roughly patients in their care. Um, so that's a very small patient population compared to your doctor, your primary care physician, or mine, who you might be seeing out in a private practice or at one of the medical groups around the area. Um, this is important because our patients are older, are medically complex. Many of them have a lengthy history of, you know, not receiving enough care or the best care, um, missing out on care because of financial reasons. So it's important to us that we try to make up for that and develop close relationships. We consider it or we call it a very high touch 
high visibility model of care um, where the participants are able to form close personal relationships with all of the folks on their team who, as you can see, um, the person that they'll be talking with most often is their care coordinator who keeps it all running smoothly, helps make their appointments, arrange their transportation, make sure that information gets to and from the participant and their family to the direct clinical care providers. And everyone in the care team, which is made up of 11 members, works together um, and knows everything that's going on with each of their patients in real time. So that's uh, the way it works. Um, adult Day Health Center is part of this model. Not all of our participants attend an Adult Day Health Center, but for those who do, and that's going to be the place where they spend their days, most of their time, and get to know the staff in the center and throughout the building that way. Um, the basic criteria for PACE enrollment are financial and then medical and social. So dually eligible is uh, what we refer to as people who are eligible for both Medicare and Mass Health. And I'll speak about that in a little bit more detail on an upcoming slide. Um, but for those who do meet that financial criteria, generally everything, as this slide says, is at no cost. They do not have co-pays. Their prescriptions come from our pharmacy. Um, if there is ever a additional outside service that someone needs that their doctor has ordered and there is going to be any kind of cost that is taken into consideration and explained up front and, and it's not going to become a burden to the patient or their family. So in addition to their medical care, we have a great uh, social support, which is what people are usually most lacking in their lives. So um, some of the things that we see a lot and that our social work team helps with is that if our participant is living in a home that they can no longer stay in, the building's been sold, the rent has been increased exponentially, we've seen a lot of that, or they are living with a family member in a private home and for whatever reason that situation is no longer available, we help with finding appropriate new housing, coordinating other government benefits that are not completely under our umbrella, but services that usually coordinate with it, such as SNAP, fuel assistance, and things like that, um, helping them with end-of-life planning, which is something that most people uh, don't do enough of or are lacking, and especially people who are in this lower-income um, area and, and even middle class people think that's only for the wealthy. It certainly is not. They may have um, other needs that they need to plan for and make sure that their family is aware of if they have a family who's involved. And also supporting uh, those of our participants who are fortunate enough to have family or loved ones providing care in the home. Uh, we make sure that they have a lot of support, that they know who to turn to when they have questions and that they're not getting burned out or um, you know, becoming unaware of anything that's going on. We really encourage our participants and their family members and caregivers to be advocates and to be vocal and to work very closely with their providers. Um, some of the things that we have been able to add to our services as our area becomes larger, uh, we just added Plymouth Kingston to our service area last summer and then some of the communities on the upper part of Route 3 in the fall of 2002. So as our service area gets larger, as Michael mentioned, we have our center in Brockton. And as I said, we have one up in Mattapan. Um, someone who is in Plymouth and resides there and needs to use adult day health services most likely is not going to want or be you know, very well suited to take a long ride on a van over to one of our adult day health centers. So to streamline it for both the participants and our staff, we have partnered with um, other adult day health organizations out in the community that are described here. Um, people will still receive their transportation to their local adult day health center. And then rather than them having to come to us for the very routine and uh, frequent type of visits that they might need, our staff is going to visit them at the Adult Day Health Center to provide things like skilled therapy, PT and OT and speech, um, and regular little nursing services, vital checks, 
um, medication questions and things like that. Our staff would go there and see their participants in the ADHC that they are working at, um, that they are visiting during the day, rather than have all of those people come to one of the centers for what might be, you know, 15 to 45 minute visit. It makes more sense for us. It makes more sense for the participants. Um, the biggest question that people have about joining PACE is do they have to leave their current primary care physician or other medical providers? Generally, the answer is yes. The point of PACE is to have all your primary care services under this one umbrella with this increased level of communication that we're able to provide. However, with respect to people's comfort and needs, um, we have begun to make it available for folks to still see their existing primary care physician a couple of times a year. And again, our care coordinator is going to help make those appointments with this outside provider, provide transportation, and also make sure that any notes or records from that provider's visit are coming to ours so that we you know, are all on the same page with this patient. Um, and for specialists, we we are contracted with specialists of all kinds throughout our entire service area. However, if a participant has an existing relationship, long-term, a very important you know, service such as behavioral health is the one that we see the most as you probably all do as well. That is not a relationship that we you know, want somebody to have to leave after 10, 15, 20 years with a therapist or with a psychiatrist. So again, when they enroll, all of their care needs on that specialty will be coordinated with the existing um, provider and they'll be included in discussions as needed. Um, there's a nice a nice little handout that we have from the Mass Pace Association with a lot of uh, nice statistics on it, um, and I, I should share that, and if anybody's interested in seeing it, I can certainly send it over and have it emailed out, and my contact info is in the chat. You feel free to email or call me at any time. Um, these are just some of the many benefits that are generally applicable to our participants. Um, most people do not want to transfer, transfer to live in skilled nursing. Um, and it's anecdotally, I'm sure clear to all of you that when care can be provided in the home, people's outcomes are better than we would see if that same person um, is living in a facility. Um, it just enables us to provide a lot more care and enables them to have a lot better communication with us. Um, again, there are certain people who are not able to enroll because their needs are beyond what we consider we can safely provide in the home, and some of those are mentioned here. Um, it's very difficult to work with people um, who are homeless or who have had very unstable housing for a long period of time. Um, that's just one of the kind of stumbling blocks that we that we run into. There's some cases that work out, most do not. If somebody does not have an address, it is really not appropriate to enroll them. People who need around the clock care is not something that we can do. Um, people who have been referred by somebody like one of you or by a family member who is very well-meaning and very excited about PACE and says, oh, this will be perfect for you, but that person has no interest in it. Um, we can only lead the horse to water and they are allowed to make their own decisions and they've become aware of it. If they decide in six months or a year that it does sound good, they can certainly revisit the idea. But if someone is not into it, it, we cannot force them in any way and they will not do well if they enroll and just to make people happy. Here is a map of our service area, which you can um, refer to. There is a couple of neighboring towns who unfortunately are not on the map yet. Carver is one, Middleborough is another. We get a lot of calls from providers who are working with folks who live in areas like that. We are currently unable to serve those two towns as an example. CMS is who um, decides your coverage and the zip codes which you are going to serve. Right now, about two thirds of the zip codes in Massachusetts have access to a PACE program of which there are eight that operate in Massachusetts. Um, the goal is to have all the zip codes covered by 2026, which is ambitious, but I think it can be done. Um, for instance, all of Cape Cod does not have access to a PACE program. 
Um, but right now, this is where Harbor Health is able to serve. The income and financial requirements at a very basic level, and again, uh, every case is individual and looked at clearly, but the basics are that for Mass Health, um, their income cap is $2,742 per month. That's gross income from all sources. Again, the same asset, cash asset limit of $2,000 for Harbor Health Pace Mass Health Program. There is not the five-year look back that you might be familiar with for um, the other versions of it that are available for skilled nursing and out in the community. Um, participants are able to still own their home if they do and their car if they do. Those are not considered assets. There's also allowances for like small life insurance policies, prepaid funeral plans, um, and things like that. But your applicant is guided through the process very closely by our enrollment team, which is a small uh, group who work very closely together. So it's not a call center. They don't get a case number. They don't have to call and wait on hold and then tell their whole story again to the next person. Um, the application process generally takes four to six weeks, um, but no one's left in the dark. They're able to speak with the folks on their enrollment team throughout the process um, with any questions and help with getting any of the information that we need. Uh, we can take people from ages 55 and older. So those who are under 65, but 55 to 64 have to have a qualifying permanent disability that you might also know as a Title 16 disability. This is generally somebody who has SSI or SSDI and has had it you know, for some period of time. Um, and those who are 65 and older do not need to have that technical disability, but they do need to be at a level of medical complexity. That means they are struggling to safely meet their needs at home, um, but we feel that their independence can be preserved and, and potentially improved by the PACE program. Um, we follow the same guidelines as the Frail Elder Waiver, which is maybe a, a list of um, explanations that you're all more familiar with. So folks who are um, applying for the Frail Elder Waiver would be at the same level of care as those who are applying for PACE. The difference is if they are in PACE, they are getting all of those services from us, from ourselves for the most part, and from our contracted vendors for some services um, with that care coordination piece being the real difference. It's just a, another little bit about um, the financial side of it. There are hopefully people who start planning for this sooner rather than later and um, come to us earlier in the process and then go to an elder law uh, attorney and and start making these plans so that when their health or living situation becomes that they're going to need pace, um, it's a little bit easier for them to start enrolling. There's also the spend down. There's also a private pay option. Those are not uh, very common, but this type of service is actually available on a cash basis to people who want all these services and want to remain at home, and they are over well over the mass health limit, but they understand the concept of the plan um, and they are able to take advantage of it. Um, it does cost roughly $4,600 a month, I believe, to private pay for PACE, but that is still considerably less than the monthly cost uh, to private pay at skilled nursing or in any assisted living. And they still get all the same benefits and the same care coordination um, and the same level of support that anybody else does with PACE while still being able to remain in their home. If you are interested in referring to PACE, you can always call me uh, with a question. You don't have to remember everything that I said. It's You know when somebody comes in to speak with you or a family member expresses difficulties with their older relatives, um, you know if somebody's kind of struggling and in, in this situation, but it's always fine to call me or to call our enrollment team and ask any of these questions um, before the person is ready to begin a formal application. And then when they are, they'll speak with one of our two enrollment specialists who We'll go through the application, assign them to a financial specialist, set up the clinical visit, which is a minimum data set MDS that our nurse goes to the home to assess. And uh, I didn't think I left this 
picture of the van, but here's one of our vans that transport our participants from home to our centers and back and also to their medical appointments at other locations. Um, my email and Julie's are here, as well as our other community relations marketing person, Carrie Conlin, who mainly covers the upper part of our map, and I mainly cover the lower part, but you can always contact any of us with questions um, about anyone who you're working with or just in general, or if you need to make a referral and we will be always happy to hear from you. And I'm happy to take any questions and I don't know how, to, maybe you can make me stop screen sharing. I don't know how to get out of it. Uh, let's see. Here there you go. go. Thank you. Um, so if there are any questions that, and we have time, I, I can stay on for a little bit longer and I'm happy to take them. If you want to email me or call me later today, that's also fine too, or anytime um, my contact info is available. And if you don't have it, the person next to you probably does because I've been doing this in this area for a long time. I, yeah, Norma, I had a question. Um, is this <clears throat> program subject to the financial recovery uh, once the person passes? Uh, no, not sure. Honestly, I haven't encountered that situation yet. Uh, you mean that if they still have their assets when they pass away, that, that MassHealth, you know, would claim them for the amount that they've paid into it? Yeah, exactly. Still yeah. Care? Um, I honestly don't know. And I know that Julie had to hop off at 930 to go to another, um, to get on the road. I, I'm happy to find that out for you, Jillian, and let you know. I do not think it is. Okay. But I will confirm with you either way. Thank you. And then is there a PACE uh, program on Cape Cod as well? There is not. No. Okay. Hopefully, I mean, there's a huge need for it. I have no idea how CMS um, does needs assessments and decides who's going to cover what or, you know, when they will look at the Cape um, as an area. But I, I do hope that Cape Cod Healthcare maybe will, will step up and form a PACE program down there. It's certainly plenty of people who could benefit from it. Right. All right. Thank you. That was a great, very important. No, Norma, I put in the chat, but um, how do we, how do people find out where the nearest PACE is in their area? Um, if you go to the Mass Pace Association website, which okay. just Google Massachusetts Pace Association, I think literally the first thing that comes up, there's a box, you type in your zip code, and it will tell you uh, if your area is covered by a Pace program. Um, there's a few parts where, and again, CMS is a mystery to all of us, but for instance, Upham's Corner has a Pace program. Some of their Territory overlaps with some of ours in the Dorchester area, so I don't know why why CMS would do that. But if it happens that your zip code is covered by two different PACE programs, and it's rare, but there are a few, you can choose either one. Your services are not going to be different from one to the other, and I can't really say why anybody would choose one over the other. But uh, for the most part, a zip code will only have access to one PACE program, but that's the easiest way to find out if um, a zip code is covered by it. So if you are referring somebody, um, that is that is the best way to do it. And if they if they are, you know, kind of outside our area, um, you know, you may find another PACE program that that works with them. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, Norma, um, I've been hearing from some of my patients that some of the PACE programs actually have housing. Do you know anything about that? Yeah, so that's a... a we there is um some housing collaboration i need to make it very clear because a lot of times when we've started to talk about this then people think that we are a landlord or a housing agency or that we have furnished apartments available for free and i'm not exaggerating these are calls i have received and none of that is the case uh harbor health pace has done several collaborations uh, one with the boston house boston housing authority when they remodeled the ann lynch um, housing complex up in South Boston. There's a certain number of apartments in that complex that are reserved for PACE participants. It's again, kind of like the adult day health center idea. Those 32 apartments are filled with PACE participants. Our care teams go there and can, you know, see everybody in the home um, or in their, in their home setting uh, at once. Um, 
there is they still are a tenant of Boston Housing Authority. They are still need to get um, approved by the Housing Authority. They are still paying 30% of their income as rent. There is no rental assistance here. We, you know, if Boston Housing says we don't have a unit for this person or this person's Corey check is not acceptable, we cannot force them to allow a PACE participant in. Um, similarly, we have the Walker School apartments here in Taunton. So eight of those 32 apartments in the building are reserved for PACE, meaning that when one of those um, apartments becomes available, we have people who may be interested in it and we have the first right to um, introduce another resident. Again, they have to be approved by the, the housing authority and um, the company who manages the building for us and other people within the building do and can enroll in PACE. Um, but there's always going to be a certain number of units reserved. What has been more recent is our co um, congregate housing projects that we did in Bridgewater and Stoughton. So these are basically dorm style living. Um, there are eight units in the Bridgewater setting and 19 units in the Stoughton setting. Uh, each resident has basically a living area that is their bedroom, living room, a large closet, a half bathroom, the ones in Stoughton do have a small kitchen as well. Um, but then there is shared common area, full kitchen, laundry. Um, <clears throat> and this is not obviously the setting for everybody, but we have had a good, good amount of success with the people who have moved there. It obviously has to be a single person. Um, it's generally the people who are in our lower 55 to 64 age group um, and who maybe have more... <clears throat> history of social and behavioral health support needs than physical. So it's usually somebody who's more mobile, who can, you know, go out on their own, some who even still have a car and can drive. Um, you know, a lot of people have misconstrued this as an assisted living setting. There is not staff. Everyone is free to come and go as they please. They are just tenants of the building who happen to be living in a building that is reserved for pace. Um, but uh, these are wonderful initiatives, but as I said, they've been widely misunderstood to the point that I don't really introduce the topic to um, to anyone until the person's actually within the application process for PACE, because uh, a lot of people do think I can take your, you know, unhoused client who lives in their car for the last three years and put them in a furnished apartment for free tomorrow, and that is I'm not really sure where that came from. I wish we could, but we are no, you know, we're not, we're not at that point. Um, you know, and PACE, again, a lot of people kind of equate it with a VNA. They'll call me when a patient is being discharged from hospital or rehab, and I'll say, okay, when will they be home? Um, and they'll say, well, when can you be out there? And again, we're not urgent care. We are not crisis response. We are not interventionists. Um, if someone is being discharged from a hospital stay or a rehab stay, they do need to be in their home setting for at least a couple of weeks before our nurse will go out and see them because we need an accurate idea of what their baseline is and not the day they get home. They cannot be evaluated if they are still um, admitted anywhere, you know, at a hospital or a rehab. Um, I'm not sure where the housing will go from this. It, it has been successful in, in a lot of ways, but again, there is still a lot of misunderstanding about what it is and how it works. Um, and uh, it, it, it can come to the point that I'm, I'm very careful about how I introduce it to people. And sorry, one other quick question. Um, for my patients that are having difficulty hiring and maintaining PCA care, is that something that you guys we have our home health care uh, as part of our interdisciplinary team that was on that slide. Um, it's not extensive. No one's getting 12 hours of home health care five days a week. A lot of the adult day health participants will have a, a home health aide waiting for them when they get home off, off of the van, um, especially those who might live with other family members who are at work. So the home health aide will get uh, the participant in into the house, help with any personal care, make sure that they you know have food ready and, and so on and so forth. Many of our um, participants do have PCA and home health aid services coming in, but it's you know like three to four hour shifts, maybe three to four times a week. It is 
basic. It is not extensive. It is never overnight. Um, we do have our own in-house, but we, in our farther away areas, again, we are contracting out with um, with home health agencies to provide those services. And we are fortunate, I think, to not be experiencing the long delays that people who are trying to private pay or who are going through an ASAP sometimes are experiencing now. Um, we're doing a, a little bit you know, better, I think, than average with our staffing. So uh, as far as nursing and home health care, that all comes from us. Some of our participants do supplement that if they have a family or other funds, you know, in a trust that their family is using to pay for medical care. Um, sometimes they do need to supplement out with more hours. But uh, as far as what comes from PACE, it is a moderate amount of home health services for those who need it. Uh, we do have a question in the chat, Norma. Um, okay. Is there any plan to extend PACE to Fall River or New Bedford? Um, there was a, a kind of a secret document that came out at the end of last year with a list of towns on it. It was literally like a leaked document. Um, New Bedford was on that list. A couple of other random towns that are, you know, not... Uh, adjacent to us or to any of the other PACE programs that, that I looked at. Um, it's up to CMS and also up to maybe another organization like South Coast or Signature if they want to create a PACE program. There becomes a point where, like with us, our area is so large now that if it becomes any larger, uh, the the first rule, I guess, was that your territory could only be within 30 miles of your two of your centers. So we've got our two centers in Brockton and Mattapan. So like technically, Hingham, if you drew a straight line, is 30 miles from Brockton and is 30 miles from Mattapan, but driving it is not. Um, so geographically, it gets tricky to care for people when your territory gets too large. That. Fall River, uh, Lower Bristol County, New Bedford, um, Fairhaven area, certainly there is need for it. Currently, I am not aware of Harbor um, being told or asking to expand into that area. It certainly needs it like the Cape does. So I, I hope sooner rather than later, there will be an organization who, who picks up there. Great, thank you. Thank you, I didn't see that in the chat. And a few other kind of random questions here. Do people keep their insurance? No, we become their insurance provider and their healthcare provider. So it's it's our it's a capitated program. So we are reimbursed every month the same amount for each of our participants through Medicare and Mass Health. So there, a lot of people who come to us are already on Medicare and Mass Health. They, you know, that's just been their insurance for a while, which makes it a little bit easier because we already know that they're going to qualify for Mass Health. We do still have to reapply them for the PACE Mass Health. Um, they are working on making it as easy as our enrollment team calling up Mass Health and saying, "Hi, Mrs. Smith is applying for PACE. She's already on Mass Health standard. Here's her number." Uh, if she, you know, meets all the clinical requirements and everything else and is approved, just slide her over to the PACE and, you know, the PACE bookkeeping side of things. Um, right now, we do have to do another whole mass health application for them, but, you know, we kind of already you know they're qualified for it. So that, uh, but doing that means that they never have to get a referral for anything. They never have to worry that, oh, my doctor ordered a test and Medicare said they wouldn't pay for it. We're kind of our doctors can have a lot more uh, freedom to do what they want to do and what they think this patient needs without having to worry like that their insurance is going to deny the service. So um, they they will get on Medicare and Mass Health with us if they are not already on it. But a lot of people who come to us already are. Can they get back on to access like their hospice benefit if they yes. became it? Okay. Yep. Yep. Um, and there's a, a also, a, I should say, a very small, but about 3% disenrollment rate um, per year, other, other than those who are disenrolled because of, of passing away. Um, and that 3% is often, um, for the most part, people who did get to the level that they really had to transition to um, a skilled setting. 
Um, and there's a small portion of people who join and, and do decide that they don't like it and they disenroll and that's not an issue. Um, everything, because it's Medicare based, starts on the first of the month. So if you uh, had enrolled at the beginning of the year and now it's April and you think, okay, PACE is not for me, you'll disenroll, but you'll you'll still be with us until April 30th, the same way as if you left your job today, your insurance there would probably cover through the end of the month because that's just the way they work it. Um, as I was saying about the application process, it's like about 48 days now. So if someone's um, application was approved today, their benefit with PACE, their enrollment would officially start on May 1st. If you started an application today, which is April 12th, then let's just say it all went perfectly. Um, and you know your stuff was all approved by May 24th, your service is gonna start on June 1st. Um, and the same on the way out if somebody does disenroll. But yes, um, we, and we do collaborate with hospice care, of course, but yes, uh, to access the Medicare benefits, same thing. And I, I just had a quick question before we wrap up. Uh, you, you talked about Carver being a new town and going down as far as Plymouth. Um, how many participants do you have from those sort of southern tier towns that are down in our area? Um, it's, it's fairly evenly distributed. Boston probably seems like there's a little maybe more up there because it's smaller and tighter neighborhoods. And down here, we've got our rural areas, the Plymouth, I'm sorry, the Plimpton, you know, Hanson, that kind of middle area where, where people are really more spread out. Um, probably 60% are on the upper half of the map and 40% on the lower. The program started up in Mattapan in 1996. And so that's where it, it has its base. And then it's, you know, trickled down this way. Um, and as it got larger is the reason that they needed to add another marketing person, you know, which is me because Carrie couldn't be going to every meeting and going to every visit. Um, so we're actively working to expand that. The Brockton Center opened in 2017. It is a beautiful, brand new, remodeled. Um, it was actually a temple in Brockton and when Harbor Health purchased it, they worked very closely with the congregation to preserve the integrity of the building's history. And if anybody would ever like to come and see the building, again, contact me and I'm happy to host a visit anytime. Yeah, it is a beautiful building. I like As I said at the beginning, Julie took me on a tour mm -hmm. after you opened and I was really impressed. Um, I put in the chat the, the Mass Pace Association oh, thank you. Uh, link and right on the front page it says find a Pace program near you. Yep, it's that it's easy. Just put in the zip code and it will tell you if there is one. And it will give you the contact info for it too so you don't have to go to another website to find that. And Amy put in the, the, uh, the link to your to, to Pace, the Elder Service Plan under Harbor. Um, and I, if you can send us the slides, Norma, we can make sure everyone gets them so they have yep. your contact info. Karen and Kim actually have them. Oh, okay, very good. Yeah, yes, we'll welcome. send them out, Share definitely. I can. All right. um, and Thank Teresa, you. I see your other question, and that's really odd. It's not a very common last name. Strangely enough, I did a presentation at Senior Housing in Marshfield last week, and one of the women who attended told me that that was her maiden name and she grew up not far from where I did, but we talked at length and couldn't find any common relatives. Um, so I I'm, grew up in East Boston and uh, I, I, my Marotta family was small um, and I, I never had any cousins or anything with this last name because my dad's sibling did not have any children. So I, I do not think I am related to them, but thank you for asking. And it's always fun to meet another one. I grew up with Marauders in Stoughton, Mass. So there you go. So did, okay. So did that woman in Marshfield, yep. oddly enough. It's a small world. Yep. All right. Well, Norma, thank you so much. Thank you uh, all for having us today. Yeah, and please do reach out anytime with questions. <laughs> it's uh, my pleasure to just educate people about this and also. Um, a lot of the referrals, as I said, once I talk to the family or our enrollment people do, it, it is clear at the outset that PACE is not the right thing for them, whether it's because of income or because of their needs, but we are all actively working to know about all of you and everything else that's available so that we can guide them to what might be the, the right solution for them and their family. So thank you all for doing what you do and, and presenting when you do so that we can learn um, more about everything that's available to people. 
Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, and we, I do have a couple announcements and then we'll open it up for folks who want to talk about their programs. Um, we have a couple exciting things coming up with the uh, Chuna, with the South Shore Community Partners in Prevention. April 28th, we are hosting with the Greater Brockton Chuna a Community Health Worker Forum that's going to be at South Shore Health. Um, I'm not sure what the name of the building is, but it's in Rockland. Uh, Kim has sent that out and we'll make sure people get that. We're really looking forward to that. I think, what's it, nine o'clock, Kim? It's nine to 11 and I'm gonna pop the registration link with more info in the chat right now if anyone wants to sign up. Awesome, so that's Friday the 28th. Um, Ju uh, our annual meeting will be in person, woohoo! So we get to see each other and drink coffee and eat muffins, which is two of my favorite things to do. Um, that'll be Friday, June 9th, and it's going to be at Duxbury Library, the Duxbury Public Library. They have a nice uh, conference room there. Uh, at our annual meeting, we will be voting on our new board, and we have several openings. We've had a few people uh, retire and drop off, so we have openings on our steering committee. If you're at all interested in serving on the steering committee, please feel free to reach out to me or to Kim or to anyone who's on the committee. I see Karen is here. I know Nancy was here before. I think she might've had, oh, Nancy's still here. So we have a great steering committee. We, we do a lot of great work. We have a lot of fun. Um, and if you're interested in joining, it's a once a month meeting to kind of steer the committee. Surprise, surprise. Just uh, make our, you know, make sure that we have great speakers and then when we have grants come up deciding on those so really excited about that that'll be on june 9th and also on june 9th we'll have our award our health literacy award winners which we've done for the last five years i guess six years Teresa Harmon, former health literacy award winner back about three years ago i think uh so it but to get a good winner like Teresa Harmon, we need nominations so uh, Kim has sent out, and I'm sure she'll send out again, the nomination form. If you know someone who's doing great work to raise awareness about a health issue, to remove obstacles to good health outcomes for, for vulnerable populations or for people in general, please do take a moment and nominate them. Um, we had a great ceremony last year at the Plymouth Public Library. I think it was one of our first times back in person and we're excited to have a, a, an in-person uh, meeting this year as well on June 9th. Um, last thing I just want to mention, uh, for the last few years, the Plymouth Library has sponsored a health fair in the fall. And we as a Chennai and VID Plymouth are kind of co-sponsoring that with the library this year. Uh, Tom Kamiski, who is the outreach librarian um, at the Plymouth Library has kind of been booted upstairs to be the reference librarian or the assistant reference librarian, but that limits his ability to do some of the outreach that he's done. So Karen Peterson has very graciously um, offered to sort of be the, the chief chief person behind this, but I, and I'm happy to be helping her and supporting her uh, through the Chana. But um, we'll send out more information about that. Tom already had a bunch of people signed up who had been at the uh, had had tables at the health fair last year. So if you're interested in that at all, please do get in touch with either Karen or myself, or always you can send an email to Kim at um, chana23 at gmail.com. Is that right, Kim? I always forget. That is, now you got it. That's in the chat too, if folks are um, scrolling through, chana23 at gmail.com. I, I always just type CHN and that's what comes up and I forget what the rest of it is. So I think that's all I have for announcements. Does anyone else have an announcement or a program coming up that they want to mention? Debbie? I just want to let folks know that our Massachusetts Healthcare Training Forum meetings will begin next week. Those are statewide meetings right now. They're they're on Zoom, but I will put... Oh. Debbie, you just muted yourself. Well, someone muted you. <laughs> Whoops, sorry about that. There you go. Um, I just put a link in the chat for our Massachusetts Healthcare Training Forum meetings that start next week. 
Um, we work in collaboration with Mass Health and to communicate information across the state regarding Mass Health programs and other state programs um, to to everyone, to healthcare organizations, community-based organizations, who whoever is interested in the information. Our agenda is up there, so if anyone is interested in that, please go ahead and click on that link and join us. Have you tell us again what does MPF stand for? Massachusetts Healthcare Training Forum. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, we used to do statewide meetings um, in five different areas in the state. Um, then they broke it down to four areas, but now we're remote, hopefully to get in person soon, but we don't know when. Slowly but surely. Mm -hmm. Any other announcements? Programs? Well, thank you all so much for being here. Um, you'll be hearing more from us about these upcoming events. Our next meeting before the annual meeting in June will be on May 10th. And it'll be sort of part two of our mental health uh, panel discussion. We'll have folks from uh, NAMI talking about the roadmap and talking about a lot of their services. And we'll also have uh, someone from the behavioral health hotline um, talking about the hotline. and. Uh, uh, the resources that are available through that. So please do join us if you can. That'll be on Wednesday, May 10th, same bad time, same bad channel. And uh, thank you all for being here. I guess I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Teresa, is there a second? I, or people are just signing off. All right, Dora, second. All in favor, just leave the uh, Zoom, I guess. <laughs> Thank you all. Have a wonderful day. Enjoy this beautiful weather. Bye-bye now.